Good evening, everybody. Welcome. This is the double lecture, and it's going to be presented this evening by Eusebius Makaiza. For those of you who are not exactly sure who Eusebius Makaiza is, how come you came to the lecture? <laughs> He's a very well known. Um, I put out in one of the tweets, opinionista person who have opinions. He has had radio shows on very famous, well-known, big radio stations up in Gauteng. This I'm explaining for the local people, you see, because they're not all familiar with Radio 702 or Power FM. And they're not all sure what's happening up there in the gold mines. Uh, he also writes columns uh, and invariably or, no, not in very, but very often these columns are quite controversial. You say this likes being provocative. And if you doubt what I'm saying, just think, what is the title of the address that he's going to give you this evening? He's come, he's come here to Cyphers Africa, where they are all scientists. And the title of his presentation is, If I told you science has limits, would you believe me? Now, I'm not sure what the expression is preaching to the converted, but everyone here is, believes in science. This is what we believe in, you say this. And you're going to tell us here that there are limits? This is going to be hard to believe. But we can't wait to hear what you have to say. So, why don't you come up and give it to us? Thank you so much for that fantastic introduction, and thank you to everyone who is here this evening. Um, it's funny that you should start by asking whether they know who Eusebius is. I think it's more apt to ask who Christina Scott was, because this lecture is in many of my friends in media, many of my friends like Ms. Anya Mori, the director of this festival that I've noticed in school, have also been not just folks that admired as a journalist, but also regarded Christina Scott as in fact a mentor of hers. It will also explain why I'm here, although I know nothing about science. Christina Scott was a fantastic journalist who did a lot to popularize science and the communication of science, despite the fact that science can be incredibly difficult and technical. So difficult that I dropped it at the end of grade nine at the history instead. Horrible choice that a school forces on you. But part of the reason is that we run away from science. If you told me that I would one day be at a science festival to give a talk, any talk, I would have told you that there's a better chance of me winning the lottery because science scares the living daylight out of me. So this memorial lecture honors one journalist, and we don't have enough of them in the country, who did an amazing not compromise the complexity of scientific ideas and yet at the same time reach as wide an audience as possible. I think it's a wonderful gift. I've got a handful of other journalists who came to my mind when Anya asked me when I would do this year's lecture, and I said, but why haven't you had Leone? Why haven't you had Sarah Wilde? And of course, they've already been, in the first couple of years of this memorial lecture, being the ones who have given it, precisely because we do not have enough journalists who have followed in the footsteps of Christina. But then I thought to myself, I'd love to come back, any excuse to come to Grahamstown. The last time I was in this venue, I think I was probably reciting a poem. <laughs> if not playing the piano, was to hold it in a nice step of competition. So I like an excuse to come back because I'm from Grahamstown. But I also didn't want to be fraudulent, not only because I've got trolls on Twitter who will bust me if I attempt to be, but, but because you should come into a space respectfully and not come and tell you absolute rubbish about science if you already have scientific understanding don't have. And of course my background is in moral philosophy. That's what I specialize in, that's what I spend a lot of time thinking about, but this is a science festival and at the same time, we are here, not ultimately to hear what Eusebius has to say about science, but to honor the, the legacy of Christina Scott. So how do you do all of that? And I said to Anya some very good advice I got about my first ever manuscript that I wrote that has never got published. It was supposed to be a memoir about high school, but it was really, really weak. And an excellent reader said to me, what you did was you were describing rather than showing. And it's a very important distinction in storytelling. And the penny only dropped years later, but I haven't gone back to that manuscript. And so I thought, instead of doing, describing, 
by talking about what does it mean to be an excellent communicator, I will simply attempt, and the audience in terms of the diversity is a wonderful challenge for me as a communicator, I will attempt rather than to describe what clear communication is about. And I'm going to demonstrate it by engaging scientists, but from within my turn as a philosopher. And I think the best way to honor the memory of Christina is to challenge you with a complex topic, try and communicate it clearly, and although it may not have anything to do with your favorite area of science, I hope that you will see it as a demonstration on how to communicate a technical issue clearly, which is ultimately what her legacy was about. So to that end, I am here to tell you about the limits of science because I may not have enjoyed science as a student, but I do enjoy thinking about science as a philosophy student. And so there are three different aspects to my talk. And I will let the cat out of the bag because I'm not reading a novel. So I'll tell you what the conclusion of my talk is right up front. I will then make an argument for each one of the three views that I want to put on the table. The final one is the discussion. And then I will give you a good 20 minutes to throw stones at me. Um, verbal ones, not, not literal ones. <laughs> I'm going to argue that science can tell me how to live. That's going to be the first thing. That science doesn't have anything particularly interesting to tell me about morality and my field of moral philosophy. As a moral philosopher, you are interested in the question, what is the morally right thing to do? If I have to choose between giving money to a beggar and taking my sisters out or a lover out for an expensive meal, what is the right thing to do? If I want to buy techies that will cost 10,000 rand, but I can actually also get ones that cost 100 rand and give the rest of the money to charity, should I give to charity? That's the kind of question that moral philosophers are interested in. And if you are an ancient Greek philosopher, you are interested in an even more difficult moral question. What kind of person should I be? What does it mean to be a person, for example? Now, those questions fascinate me just in and of themselves. But I'm here to engage in science. And what I want to tell you is that science and the march of science is not going to help us solve those questions. Those deep moral questions is the one area where the scientists, however clever they are, whichever NASA uh, astronauts are here, they can't reach those questions. So that's going to be the first part of my talk. But I'm going to tell you why when I do that. <laughs> then I want to shift to the methods that scientists employ and ask, are there downsides to thinking like a scientist? And I have to warn you, the answer, unfortunately, is yes. And I will explain why. And because, hopefully, I will have demonstrated what it's like to communicate difficult issues clearly, I will only spend about literally a minute telling you more bluntly what are a couple of good tools for you to use in your own area of expertise when you speak to people who are not experts. Okay, so that's the basic plan. And I'll, and I'll engage you any question that you're allowed to ask me. So let's get on with the first part of the talk then. Can science tell me how to live my life? Does science have anything useful to say? For me, an interesting area of science to take as an example to make my bigger point that science can't tell me how to live my life is if we look at genes and we ask ourselves, what are genes and how do they function in biology? And I don't know the finer scientific mechanisms for how genes work, just the basic, basic elements of the theory of evolution. But what I do know about a gene as a philosophy student, and I can't wait to be corrected if I get it wrong, <laughs> is that a gene is basically a predisposition towards behavior. Now, that is just fancy English for saying, if you were maybe a politician, you've got tendency, okay? So genes are just tendencies. You see that there's a tendency to be chachara, to fight with Helen Ziller, to do all sorts of things. Genes are biological versions of things we normally observe about each other in our personality traits, in our interactions with each other. So you will say, this guy tends to be loud, rude, whatever. So characteristics that you pick out about a human being, that's a very good approximation for understanding what a gene is. A gene tells us what you are predisposed towards. <clears throat> if you had to go to the other side of the tracks in Grantstown, across the bridge dividing this apartheid geography town, you will bump into my cousins. And believe it or not, 
Um, a whole bunch of them are twice my size. They're even bigger than I am, with bigger beer boots than I have. And that is despite the fact that some of them played provincial cricket, were snapped up by kings with college before being dumped back in the town done with the trick rugby playing, but their bodies look very similar to mine, and that's because the Mackaisers have a genetic predisposition for obesity. We, we do. We're very unfortunate. The only nice part of it that I've discovered in trying to lose 20 kilograms of weight over the last year is that we also have a gene for, for building muscle very quickly. Unfortunately, it's not offset by the rate at which we get rid of our, our beer boots. <laughs> but there is the genetic makeup of men in my family. It's a predisposition. And I, I'm seeing the skeptical thought bubbles above maybe science lovers or science teachers, because they're wondering, so how will this connect with your skepticism about questions of morality? And the answer is simple. If I have a genetic predisposition towards obesity, let me ask you a question. They asked the, maybe the other people in the front. Given my description of what a gene is, a gene is, right? If I say to you, aha, I've discovered that you have a gene that predisposes you towards obesity, does that give you a reason to immediately run to KFC and go and eat a bucket of KFC? No, it doesn't, does it? Okay, now you on my side, the scientists are going to start losing you. <laughs> because what it means is that the genetic predisposition towards obesity at best tells me how my body will respond when I make certain kinds of choices about what I want to eat. That's what it tells me. It does not give me a reason to go and have a streetwise fight and eat it up alone very quickly. It doesn't give me a reason to do that. It doesn't answer the question, should I eat a bucket of KFC? All it tells me is, if I eat it, and someone else eats it, I may be showing the consequences more quickly than the other. It means to have a predisposition. That predisposition means that I'm more likely than the other person to get obese, but it doesn't give me a reason, let alone a decisive reason, to go and gobble up three plates of food over, over dinner. Now, it's not a silly example, it's a serious example, it's not an example made for school learners who are clever on a late night on Sunday at this lecture. It's an example I would happily make at a philosophy conference on campus in a lecture engaging scientists with whatever PhDs they have. It is a basic fact that a gene is not the same thing as determining your behavior. And that distinction matters. A gene tells me a predisposition, the way in which you're oriented towards the world, if you want to use a slightly it's like a metaphor, but it doesn't give me the predictive ability to say, this is what Joseph will pull up tomorrow morning. And that's the difference between a gene determining what you will do and a gene merely predisposing you towards particular behavior. And this is across, across science, whatever your, your, your favorite discipline is. Whether we talk at a higher level, psychology, for example, or sociology, it's exactly the same thing. If we discover that aggressive behavior, particularly behavior that men are predisposed to, or even, I don't know, a certain subset of men are predisposed towards aggression, it doesn't give you a reason to give your friend a fat club. All it means is that you are more likely to respond to triggers, whether they be environmental triggers, biochemical triggers, Responding worse to a banking that you buy from a car guard as a student than someone else. That's all it means, is that you will respond differently to different inputs, whether it be inputs of a social nature, food that you eat, substances that you take. That's genius. Whether we talk about personality traits, disorders, all sorts of things that you are predisposed towards, all that biology can really tell me is what is likely to happen to me if I make certain kinds of choices but it doesn't force me to make those choices. It does not, to talk about the elephant in the room for the academics, it doesn't take away my free will. And as long as I have that, I have the ability to resist my genetic predisposition. And that is the key reason why science can't settle questions of morality. They can't. Let's take a nice, very personal, very difficult example. Homosexuality. There's a big debate amongst 
the LGBTI activists about whether it would be useful to discover that there is a gene that predisposes Eusebius Mechizer towards being attracted to men. The reason why many LGBTI activists are excited by that question is that they hope that homophobes will stop hating when you show them, here's the gene, like cut off Eusebius's body, there it is. Equally, some homophobes hope if such a gene is never found, it gives them extra reason to say to Eusebius, Morphe, because after all, there's no gene that explains his behavior. But here's the snag. Both the homophobe and the gay rights activists just do not understand science. I say with my standard seven science. Because if they did, they would realize that the, the gay gene debate doesn't settle a moral question. It doesn't help the activist who thinks clearly. And it doesn't help the homophobe. Well, they never think clearly. And the reason for it is twofold. Let's say you discover, you see this as a predisposition, which I do, I flaunt it with gay abandon. But it doesn't give me a moral reason to pull into a boy and direct a parrot. It just tells me that I'm more likely to have my hormones go wild when I see boys. But it doesn't determine my homosexual behavior. That is a choice. So discovering that I have a gene doesn't mean that I must act on the gene. In the same way in which having a gene for obesity does not mean that I must go and eat as many wimpy burgers as possible. Genes are not as powerful as scientists like to believe. They're not even as interesting. <laughs> but equally, the other side, so if you're a homophobe, hold your horses at this point, because you're not helped out by the fact that, that I might not have a gene. So just as the activists are wrong and think that a gene gives us reason to endorse homosexuality, <laughs> similarly, we shouldn't get excited if we never find the gene. Because the question is, is homosexuality morally allowed? The question cannot be answered by saying, I didn't discover a gene in the lab. And there's one reason why, if you can't complete the thought process for yourself, because why should I take my moral cue from genes? Why should I answer the question is it okay for me to hit on a guy directly parrot? Why should I try and settle that moral question by asking what did the, what did the scientists discover when they took a part of me and they put it in a petri dish and looked at it in weird ways? Why, why must I wait for them before I can settle that question? Because I can give you very good reasons why it's okay for me to snog a guy. It is found. And I can tell you the reasons for that that have to do with choice, whether I'm harming other people around me, an expression of my love for another human being who looks similar to me, and all that beautiful stuff that will get tears in your eyes. But at no point in telling you why it should be morally and legally allowed for me to engage in homosexual activity will I make any reference to science. So neither the pro-gay rights person or the anti-gay rights person understand the limits of science when they have debates about whether there's a gene for homosexuality. Okay, so I've given you an example of food, obesity, gene, predispositions, do not give me a reason to overeat at dinner. A gene for homosexuality, absent or not, doesn't tell me anything about whether homosexuality is morally acceptable, permissible. And the examples I would hope to persuade you that the moral question cannot be settled ever with reference to what happens in biology. Before I move to the second part of my thought and tell you why the scientific way of reasoning has some really, really bad downsides, I just want to, because I can see that you are incredibly nerdy, I want to qualify the first part, the first part of my three-part three parts to my talk by adding two little complexities. Okay? Are you still with me? Mm -hmm. The first complexity is that there is one part of what's happening in the world of science where as philosophy students we shouldn't be too arrogant. 
we don't entirely know how far the march of science will be going in giving us the most complete possible description of human behavior. We already understand human at incredibly, incredibly low levels of explanation, subatomic particles, all sorts of weird random things that happen in your brain structure that I don't get. So we increasingly, as scientific knowledge expands, get an ever more complete description of why or how human beings behave. And one question that does scare me as a philosophy student interested in moral questions is whether the basis on which I reject science as not being able to settle moral questions may one day be challenged, if not at the moment. And that basis is the two words I mentioned three minutes ago, free will. So when I said the gene can't tell me what to do, I was assuming that I genuinely have free will. That when you put before me an apple and a chocolate, that it is sincerely to freely decide between the apple and the chocolate which one I want to eat right now. I experience the world like someone who's got the power to make three autonomous choices. And one question where I have to eat humble pie as a philosophy student is that I'm not sure whether that's an illusion, whether the feeling that I'm making a genuine choice may be psychologically how I experience the world but then in reality, that perhaps when you put personality trait, environmental factors, genetic predispositions, even if they're not determining your behavior, but it could be that the more complete our understanding of how behavior works, the more we're going to encroach on that powerful, millennia-old feeling of generally having free will. That would be a threat to the idea that I can genuinely make choices. Until in science that is that complete, I remain steadfast that the question, what should I do? Should I give money to the beggar or should I spend it on another round of beer? That question is not a question that scientists can answer. And the second complication I want to add to it, if there are any philosophers in the house, is that it really is just the difference between what we call a descriptive claim and a word that I use far too often in public called a normative claim. Don't worry about the words, understand the concept. A normative question, which is the kind of question philosophers care about, is a question about how should we behave? The word should. What kind of society should we have as South Africans? What should be in the constitution? What should I do? When I have a should questions, we call normative questions. We contrast them with descriptive questions. And as much as I wish I was as clever as the scientists here, I think normative questions are cooler and harder to think about than descriptive ones, even if the tools of scientists are really impressive if you can master them. Because as complicated and interesting and as wonderful as the world of science is, at the end of the day, what all scientific descriptions are in common is that they merely describe the world. They don't tell people how they ought to live. They don't think about how society ought to be arranged. Those questions don't arise in science. Science at heart is about how do we describe society and what is the most complete and the most accurate description of how things actually work. And that is the real philosophical reason why science can never really have to live our lives because questions about how to live your life are normative questions and scientists are not interested in them and most scientists are not good at them. It takes a different kind of discipline to answer the question, what should I do? Scientists are intellectually most comfortable asking the question, how do things work? It's very different to asking, what should I do? So what then about the way in which scientists reason? The reason, you know, I've been thinking about this for a couple of years now. I, I did competitive debating in high school and at university, and there's a parallel between competitive debating 
and scientific method. As debaters, you become, and actually also as analytic philosophers, you become obsessed with evidence, with logic, with formal logic. And it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. If you are intellectually curious, as a student, as a researcher, just as a human being, then you must have an interest in truth. And you should be skilled in the basic methods that science uses. Because the methods that scientists use is the, the hallmark of logical excellence. But there are downsides to, to the method. And, and I think it's important to think about them. I think there are social downsides, and there are also intellectual downsides. Right? So let's take, let's take an example. We'll play with the example of gay rights. I, I used to delight in being able to go up to a whiteboard and say to an audience of homophobes, I'm going to give you a formal, logical breakdown of how your, your, your arguments and your beliefs about gay people work. Premise one, homosexuality is unnatural. Stop. Premise two, anything which is unnatural is immoral, full stop. Conclusion, homosexuality is immoral. And then you can introduce symbols, all A are B, all B are C, therefore all A are, are C. You can use Venn diagrams, you can use fancy techniques, informal logic, and informal logic even. You don't even have to use formal logic. And like a mathematician, you can see that the argument is a perfectly valid argument. If the premises are true, the conclusion is true. And then I come up with my trick as a formal logic student. I say, but aha, your premises may support the conclusion, but are your premises true? Because if they are not, then we know from scientific reasoning that they've been falsified, and therefore your argument is lame, and you haven't justified hating gay people. And this is what's wrong with your first premise. Blah, 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 blah. Second premise. Blah, 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 blah. So you go on. But how many homophobes do you think I've converted with my display of formal logic? None. The most I've achieved is making one or two homophobes feel embarrassed that a gay guy is better than logic than them. I haven't changed the world. I haven't changed attitudes towards homosexuality. I've just shown off an ability to use formal logical techniques very well. It's the same thing that happens in debate. Debaters are trained to not care very deeply personally, but to see debating as a competitive activity like rugby, cricket. You suspend your own belief for 15 minutes or an hour, you get a topic, and you think about the arguments for and against, and you pretend that you want to be in favor of, I don't know, sanctions against Zimbabwe, or opposing sanctions against Zimbabwe, and off you go using the logical technique. But there are, there are these two, two downsides here. I'm chuckling because the one downside we might think is frivolous. But the older you get, and I'm getting bored and old, old now, so these things matter to me more than they may to perhaps a student of science or philosophy or a competitive debater who has yet grown up. But the first, first problem or limitation, so I'm not here to tell you scientific method and a commitment to truth is a bad thing. Truth is important. And learning to justify a claim is a very important intellectual virtue. But there are, in the first instance, social downsides. The first social downside to guard against, I'm still learning, I get it right sometimes, and some days I don't, is that you become an arsehole. No, really, you do. Because you become absolutely obsessed with demonstrating formal logic. Truth matters, but it is not the only value that matters in interpersonal relations an intellectual inquiry, but I'll get to that one in a second. So there are many other kinds of consideration that come into play when you engage someone in conversation, in dialogue, in debate. And the scientists may be the gold standard of how to be really magical and powerful with the use of evidence, with formal logical moves that you can make. But scientists, not all of them, mercifully, are often socially awkward. Debaters are the same. Very, very awkward. Can make for horrible partners. Can be very argumentative. 
And I know that because I've had many ex-boyfriends, family members, friends who had to deal with me as a debater. Thank God I didn't have scientific skill to add on top of the debating and philosophy. <laughs> and I'd just be the worst person to, to hang out with. And I sometimes think, as I'm getting older, and realize between all the logical techniques of which science is the hallmark, and the social consequences, my goodness, and that one really loved me to have stayed with me for so long. But at the heart of it is genuinely what Plato once described, especially in young people, but I think he's letting older people off the room too quickly that if you teach formal logical techniques to young people in particular, it is it's wasted on young people. Because what you need, and this is where the second downside comes in, not only do you need to be skilled at scientific method so that you can be a really cool, nerdish person in pursuit of truth, but you also need to understand the dangers of those tools, when to use them, when not to use them, not only so that your partner doesn't run away from you, but also because it's actually intellectually sometimes very irresponsible and coming an intellectual vice to not recognize when a formal logical technique has been exhausted. One of the best things for me was to have left the university as a full-time student and lecturer because it's given me a distance from my subject, analytic philosophy, which is the humanities version of the hard sciences. And it's enabled me to see the intellectual shortcomings of the methods we use in analytic philosophy that are not profoundly different to what the scientist uses. And I'll give you one example. I think it's a beautiful example of how the social cost of scientific reasoning and the intellectual weakness of only having scientific method in your armory can sometimes actually come together. If you approach teaching, for example, or dialogue, but I think teaching is of our mind with, with all the transformations. If you want to see yourself as a teacher, high school or a lecturer, walking into a venue and in front of you are blank slates and you're about to write these amazing lessons, all these schools right here, you you, you don't open yourself up to seeing the world differently in conversation with your students or with someone that you're having a discussion with. You don't. But if you approach intellectual inquiry as not just about sharing and showing off and defending what you already know and believe intellectually, but also a certain way of approaching the world where you're constantly trying to see new shades every time you drive past the monument, you see something differently. Because the last time you were in conversation with John, you listened to John with the view to see different things in the world from John's perspective, very genuinely, very actively, you draw dialogue. And there are things that John sees that you don't see, that you are then able to have a go at recognizing for the first time, despite having driven past the monument 200 times before. That ability to open yourself up to seeing things in many different ways than before is an intellectual virtue. It's not a virtue you have if you think you are a know-it-all. Because you can make a formal logical argument, it's neat, it's in your pocket, and you walk in on your way to Mullins Hall to go and rehearse it in the exam. It's, it's, it's an important basic skill to have but it has a profound downside because there are other ways of, of seeing the world that you must answer. I'll just give one example and I'll get to the final part of my talk. What are the consequences of that lack of openness to seeing the world differently that can come from being too committed to scientific reasoning? Is that we often become very arrogant about our favorite disciplines. So if you're a philosophy student, you know this for example, Philosophy students, year grows, look down on people who do English literature, sociology, and anthropology. They're like, ah, oh, they're not as clever as we are. We may be in the humanities, but we can use mathematical symbols. And they can't. We probably had enough points to do BSc if we wanted to. They didn't. Right? <laughs> and then you hopefully have an opportunity to grow up, or you meet someone amazing like Professor Lewis Gordon. <coughs> Is my favorite international philosopher at the moment who inspires me. 
wrote a book called Discipline Decadence. Big decadent type. The basic insight in the book is quite easy to summarize. Very easy to communicate, as Christina would be able to as well, without doing injustice to Professor Lewis's intellect. But we become so obsessed with our own methods in our discipline as a chemist, as a psychologist, as a philosopher, even as a <laughs> literature specialist, that you take the methods of your discipline to be the hallmark of, of excellence intellectually and other ways of trying to make sense of the world in which we all live, you secretly don't respect it. So it may be nice to profess so and so next door in anthropology, but you actually think it's cooler for you to be the HOD of philosophy rather than anthropology. Because anthropologists, like, they're just weird. Well, no, no. There's, that is a profound intellectual failing to be that arrogant about your discipline. And that's what I'm suggesting with science. Not that science is scientifically flawed. I mean, there are contests here that I'm not going into about what scientific method is. But I'm, I'm setting that aside for the moment. All I'm suggesting is that scientific method sides, there are social costs to obsessing about formal logic. And it's also very important to be sufficiently curious to understand the usefulness of the methods that people use outside the world of science. And the same goes across disciplines, across intellectual inquiries. I'll give you one practical example that brings us back to moral philosophy. Moral philosophy students, despite looking down on psychologists, make the most ridiculous psychology claims in moral philosophy all the time. So they will say things like, people don't like pain, and therefore we should live in accordance with a moral principle that says, let's have the least amount of pain whenever you act. Oh, that's probably true, I suspect, that most people don't want to be kicked in the shins at, like every moment of the day. Pain is not cool. Unless it's between consenting adults. But even then, I suspect it has to be ready. <laughs> but just see what's going on there when the moral philosophers are, are fighting about, about whether we like pain. They are helping themselves to empirical claims that they haven't investigated. Remember, I made the distinction between normative claims and descriptive ones. So the philosopher has the audacity to be arrogant and say, human beings are, are like the following, um, enjoy the following activities. Human beings typically like pain. Human beings are made up like this. Human beings do this kind of thing. But they don't bother to walk over to their friends in the psychology department and say, what have you guys discovered about human psychology? Or they will make claims about whether we have the ability to empathize with people, whether we can be selfless in our actions. But they've never done any observations. And the sociology professor that they dissed behind his back wanted to ask him, have you guys discovered on anthropology about how societies work? Is it true that some societies are better at showing empathy between individuals and others, and why. They don't care for that. So this profound arrogance that you are specializing in questions about how things should be, but in the process of answering the question how things should be, you make claims about how things are, but you don't respect the discipline and the methods of those people who are specialists in questions about how things actually are. That is what Professor Lewis Gordon world-class philosopher means by disciplinary decadence. You take your discipline to be the only discipline whose methods are worth taking seriously, and if you're making claims that properly belong to another discipline, you're just not going to make up what those claims are. I think it's an, it's, it's an intellectual failing, and it, it comes, and I don't want to go on about this point, but I think it's part of the way in which universities in particular are arranged. South African universities are worse than American ones where you're not going to find someone studying both biology and philosophy. You're not going to get someone specializing in computer science, typically, and also in English literature. It's very rare. So we don't promote the idea that someone who's really intellectually curious should have an interest across disciplinary fields, because different disciplines all collaborate to help us see things in many different ways and complete our overall picture of what is happening in the world and how things should be. We don't. We box you. 
BCOM student, thou shalt never read a novel again. <laughs> and it's, it's most unfortunate. And equally, be a student, you can breathe easily, you will never have to count again. Well, the important insights from maths that can help you as you negotiate complicated questions. So I guess my second thought, the first having been that questions about what we should do can't be answered by science. My second major thought for the day then is simply that we should not be arrogant about our disciplines, recognize their strengths in the methods, but always try and see the world differently. You may be a clever scientist, but you might learn something from a friend in the English literature department. And then finally, I want to, I want to just talk directly and bring it back to Christina Scott, because as much as I'd love to engage in philosophy, and I hope some of you will ask questions of verification and challenge me, etc. Like I said, it's always better to demonstrate rather than to describe. But it really is a profound challenge in a country like South Africa to communicate clearly complicated subjects for audiences that are very diverse. We have the most atrocious inequality in South Africa. And one of the many ways in which it benefits is in terms of education and language. And Gravestone is a beautiful microcosm. In fact, it's so bad in Gravestone, Gravestone may not be the perfect microcosm because I think Gravestone may be worse than it is in the country. The inequalities, linguistically, geographically and financially. The consequence of that for communicators is that you always struggle to know who are you reaching, who are you trying to reach when you're giving a speech, when you go on radio, when you go on television, when you're writing an article for the Sunday Times. Who are you trying to reach? Who do you not mind falling asleep in the audience when you are speaking? Who are you challenging yourself to keep awake even though they probably thought that they will not be interested if they come into the room. It's a very difficult challenge for expert communicators. And the reason it's difficult, it's not your fault, so don't feel guilty. Don't feel, don't pat yourself on the back if you don't feel guilty if you're struggling. It's not your fault. It's a reflection of the country we live in. Because of those inequities, unlike in America, where the size of the population enables you to communicate the subject like, like science, to a small percentage of the population, but a large audience in terms of the overall number, we don't have that luxury in South Africa. So I'm constantly battling as a, as a would-be professional philosopher who decided not to be in the media and engage social and political topics popularly. Because the question is, who am I speaking to? The taxi driver who's got great eights? Am I trying to impress a career scientist who's now having to reflect on the limits of science for the first time? It's very, very hard. And then you have a mix of people generationally, linguistic backgrounds, discipline backgrounds. It's extremely hard because you've got to deliberately decide who's your audience. And there I want to end in her memory by suggesting that it is responsible to set yourself the highest communicative challenge to be able to reach the most number of people and keep them with you as you report on a discipline as a reporter or as you engage as a thinker, if you're putting a view that you want to critically engage uh, people on. You must try and reach the highest number of people. I can't give you all the tools, like coach debating and public speaking and how to write clearly. That's another debate. But I just want to make one or two principal points about how you must think about it philosophically. The rest of it is technique. Technique can be practiced. But it may be helpful just, just, to, just to say one or two things by way of the principle of how to communicate clearly. The first is that there really is no virtue in not being understood. I think some people enjoy it when audiences don't understand them because it makes them feel clever. <laughs> if audiences don't understand you, don't to something think that you are clever. There's also a second advantage if people don't understand you. They can't challenge you and tell you that you're wrong because you've used jargon. So if you use big words like epistemology, conspicuous, all sorts of other things. I think conspicuous was actually in the spelling competition where I won those donuts from Mr. Holder's to my teacher. So if you use big words, people will understand that they can't challenge you. That's actually intellectual insecurity. Why are you hiding? If you're confident that you can tell clever science students and career scientists in their face at their festival 
that they can't tell you anything interesting about human behavior, then say it plainly. Don't use complicated philosophy of science jargon. So it's very important not to obsess about technical language when you report and when you speak to people who are not in your discipline. If you can't say clearly, the only other circumstance under which you may not say it clearly is if you don't want to be understood. But if you understand it and you want to be understood, then you will say it plainly and you will say it clearly. And I think a lot of people don't reach as many audiences as Christina did, not because they lack the skill, although there are tools that we could talk about in a workshop, but in the first instance, because they don't desire to be understood. It makes you arrogantly feel like you're part of an elite club of really clever people. But the flip side of it is actually not arro of arrogance, it's insecurity. If you're profoundly insecure that someone likes in an audience of 1,500, 1,000 people, demonstrate that the biggest part of your talk was actually rubbish. But if you are committed, ironically enough, to the preeminent value in science, which is truth, then you should be persuaded that sometimes you're wrong. Thank you. Eusebius, when you came here to talk, I had extremely high expectations because I've read many of your articles, I've heard you on radio many times, and yet you even managed to exceed those very high expectations. Let's have one more round of applause. For you. But as we said in the beginning, there might be some provocative or let's say full provoking ideas that you transmitted to our audience and I'm sure that people are ready to ask some questions. So let's have your hands up and let's go. Please don't be shy. Q&As are usually more fun than just listening to one person. Yeah. Anything. When you serve me, something yeah. you want to expand on, anything goes. Um, just a question. Can, can you speak up quite loud? I don't know where we had a roving mic so. I think we might hear you. Yeah, just give it a okay. go. Uh, just a uh, more of a just general philosophy question. But I just could never guess. Okay, I understand why maybe science can't tell us anything about um, moral morality and what we should do. But I can't really see why um, like a formal tool of analytic philosophy should tell us anything about morality. Why they shouldn't? Why? Oh, why they? Why? Oh, okay, so you you are equally skeptical about. Philosophers' own methods to tell you about how to live. Yeah. Oh, right, okay, fair enough. That's a very good question. Well, let me answer it very quickly for now, just to get as many questions as possible. If we have more time, I'll engage you afterwards. Um, I don't think philosophers actually have a monopoly on, on reasoning about morality. That's another discipline. Philosophers are arrogant when they think that. If you read a novel, take a novel like one of my favorite novels that I'll always bang on about, Disgrace by Jane Goodson. It's a wonderful novel. In a different world, one of the careers I would like to have, many different careers I have FOMO about, is to be an English teacher. I mean, imagine what you can do with that without philosophy training, just being a creative with a moral sense, teaching that novel to South Africans, especially at, say, the trick level, and getting them to engage really hard questions about our attitudes towards animals, rape, race relations. I mean, it's all there. And it has the added advantage that philosophers' methods don't have, which is that characters are fully human. They have a narrative arc. They look like us in the novel. We can explore them. Film does the same. Film like the witness that we, that we did at school. In philosophy, we come up with these weird thought experiments. You know, imagine two people are finding themselves a line, and you know, one of them has to be killed. What are you going to do? The examples are so torturously unrelated to reality. They serve a function if we go into the details of how the methods work. But there are other disciplines that can also deliver insights about relationships, about society, about morality. And it's possible to be an English literature specialist and read a book and teach a book such that you are developing a moral sense and great moral debate amongst your third year English class without having studied philosophy. Don't tell my colleagues. <laughs> We have a microphone there. Uh, 
Um, we, we'd like it uh, to use the microphone because we're, yeah, recording we're, recording. This. So, we're recording it, so we want it to go on to the... We want a posterity. That's a great talk. Thanks. I, I really enjoyed it. Like, I enjoyed all the, the talk shows. But my question to you is, is do we explain why do we expect science to actually tell us anything about morality? What is science? That's a very good question. I guess he's not one of the ones who are converted to our amazing sciences, as you were saying. You're on my side, maybe even more skeptical than I am. I don't know. I can't answer the question, what is science? I think scientists can answer that much better. But I do think, at least globally, I mean, we don't have to be, like, overly intellectualize our general commitment to what science can tell us in society. We do live in a society where, unless you are really, really strung along, for example, by your religious beliefs, then we have a lot of faith in science's ability to tell us all sorts of things. And actually, for, with good reason. If you look at the history of science and the achievements of science, I think it's good that we have faith in science. I'm not about to go to Sangoma if I, if I have to be healed. I'm going to take pills that have been tested, falsified, verified, all the methods of science. I trust it. You know, I take it not as a matter of of just uh, belief, I take it because I have faith in the methodology through which it was tested. So there's actually a hell of a lot to be said for science in light of the history of science. And I think that's the basis of wide society. We've got so much faith not just in the achievements, but also in the future achievements of science. So maybe that's, that's the intuition that, 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 that I was assuming is probably why it's straight in the audience. I'm glad that you're an exception. Okay. Um, you speak into mic, please. Thank you so much for your presentation, really interesting. I don't know how exactly to put this question, but I think you're operating with a kind of slate of hand, actually. Because you talk about the gene as giving you certain predispositions. And then, it said, and then you said that if you're predisposed to obesity, it doesn't mean you would immediately go to KFC. In fact, it should actually make you... If you knew that you are predisposed obesity, and you know obesity is a bad thing for your health, mm -hmm. having that knowledge that you possess that gene will, should actually prevent you from doing something that's bad for you from the point of view of your health. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the, the, um, the logic of homosexual, uh, homosexuality is unnatural, it's immoral, etc. If it were possible to find a gene that said people, some people have that gene, you could no longer call it unnatural. It would actually be a very powerful weapon in the hands of LGBTI activists. So there's something about your presentation that is that I've missed, or I don't know what it is. There's some logical link that is missing. Mm. I think science does help us to make very informed choices. Mm. Whether we access up to something else, I don't know if it's free will because I don't believe actually operate in a vacuum of free will. I think free will is constrained within certain parameters. So I, I think you're you're doing something your to our minds. There's something here that is that involves a slate. I find that interesting. I've been accused of many things, wizardry is a first. I'm, see, I'm not hypnotizing you at all. But I'll take the backhand compliment. Thank you very much. I don't think that we are far off. I love your intervention. I think it's intellectually and, and otherwise, it's just also just delicious. It's beautiful. I totally agree with you. I think it's a pity that you preface it by saying that there's some sleight of hand that I'm doing. Because actually, I think we're just in dialogue and there's not deep disagreement between us at all. Let me tell you why, in two respects. Let's take your example of, uh, of homosexuality. That if the premise homosexuality is unnatural, turns out to be a false premise that it, that it settles the work that an LGBTI activist has to do. Not politically and not logically. Let's take the logical reason first. If something is natural in the sense that a gene exists that describes it in biology, we haven't yet, we haven't yet justified the different claim that it is morally acceptable. So knowing what genes we have will not constitute justifying the very different claim 
it is morally okay to act on the gene. So it doesn't help you logically. But let's think about it politically, because that's more interesting. And that's also what I meant by formal logic is not everything. Would it help politically? Actually, I think it is. There, I agree with you. I think an indeterminate number of homophobes may well take it logically, but good for me as a gay person, I can be safer in society, as a reason to not hate on gay people. So in that sense, it could be a useful tool. But, um, but it's, it's unknown if we want to be nerdish about the, the probabilistic consequences, because we don't know whether a homophobe secretly, even though they demand a gene, whether they're really going to be satisfied by that. I would bet my healthy left kidney that the guy who says it's not natural, there's no gene, and you say, well, here it is, dude, I'm going to show it to you. I'm not sure whether that's going to persuade it. I think haters are going to hate, and the fact that you come up with a gene is not going to settle the, the matter at all. So it doesn't settle it logically, and I think the work that you have to do as an LGBT activist will continue. I think a better chance you have to engage that guy is not to prove that the gene exists, or to show that one exists once it has been proven. You're going to say to him, come spend a weekend with your CBS and his gay friends. Look how wonderful they are. Okay? They crash a car, they bleed like you do. They cheat on each other like you, straight. Fully love like us do. Isn't it amazing? Touch that. That is a father effect in showing a gene. I don't want to be persuaded about it. So there, I don't think we're in deep disagreement. I think we're just in longer conversation. But before I take this one or two last questions, I do want to do justice to your first question as well. If I know that I have a gene for obesity, and you and I agree even more on your first point, it gives me a warning about my health, and it empowers me to do something about it. I go to the gym eight times a week. If I didn't, I would really be huge. Now, you've answered your own question, though, because I still have to make the choice. And that is a what ought I to do question that wasn't settled by the gene. The gene just gives me more information to make a responsible choice. But what I should do remains an open question. We've got time for one last question. I've got time for many, but we should keep it clean like good scientists would. So okay. I'll, take, let's, I'll take two or three at the same time. Um, right now. Okay, should we do that? Um, I'm starting with terminology. Um, I heard you speak of uh, descriptive and normative questions. And I'm trying to find out if one can be logical and rational, and vice versa, can one be rational and logical? And if one can be logical and make good um, ethical decisions and yet be rational in terms of how those decisions will be. Good question. And you're not struggling at all. That's perfect. And I'll give you examples for why that distinction is right. One can be logical and be in some ways intellectually completely irresponsible. <coughs> Another question? Uh, thank you. Yeah. I think your whole argument is being based Speaking on the one premise. Sorry. Into yeah. Thank you. Hi. Uh, and that is free will. Science cannot explain free will. But you haven't told us, consider free will to be something alien something mystical and beyond the reach of reason, maybe not science as it presently is. Because, and this is an important question, because I think what you are raising is a very old question, not a very modern question. It goes back 300 years ago to Descartes, when you Descartes, who actually split knowledge into two camps. One is a scientific camp, and the other one is a metaphysical one. And he put free will in the metaphysical camp which is, in other words, a theology. It's beyond the reach of knowledge. And the only person to have challenged their cards was Spinoza. And Spinoza was, was excommunicated and cut out from history, even till today. Now, it is very surprising for me that philosophers are not raising the issue of the debate between their cards and Spinoza. And one basis of science which will tackle free will as something that emanates in this world, not in another world, not in the metaphysical world. So I would like to know your position. Okay, I'll take uh, Okay, for the last, the last, last question, I'd like it from the front row of all these young people. <laughs> yeah. Can we have that microphone? Where is it? There we are. Okay. <coughs> Um, I understand the gene as something that influences a certain characteristic. 
And so you said that um, science does not answer how I should behave. But then I say a gene is something that influences a certain characteristic. So that gene has influenced a certain thought that is going to lead me to a certain um, way to handle a, a thing, a problem or, or something. So if the gene influences how I'm going to attack a certain problem, does it then not show me how I should be acting? Does it not lead me to... Um, I can't explain it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how I'm actually going to handle it. In that way, it's showing me how I should be acting. Does it maybe um the thing with obesity? It shows you you if. I, I, I totally get you. Don't worry. Great question. Yeah, okay. Thank very you very well much. communicated. Thank you. I'm going to start with your question. The answer is that you don't believe that. <laughs> but the reason you don't believe it is that when I say to you, we've discovered you have a gene that makes you really like ice cream, do you rush off to talk? You don't, do you? That's not a trick question. Let's say we're having this discussion at home or at school or wherever. If I say to you, yo, they discovered that I have a gene for ice cream, are you going to say to me, run, dude, go get ice cream? Important point here. And it's not, it's not a gimmick point. This is a point about the nature. Of, of, of influence. You use all the right descriptions, you don't misunderstand it at all, but you're giving it a little bit more power than it has, but in a way that's an important mistake in the description. Influence is not the same thing as determining your behavior. There's a massive difference between saying, shit, I grew up in a Catholic household, I've been influenced by Catholicism, I feel guilt, and actually being guilty every single day. So there's a massive gap between influence and doing. But that gap is crucial. Everything about the way in which we view human behavior is because of the gap. And I'm going to come back to you because that's where your question is located. It's that gap between influence but still having some ability to make your own choices that is the basis for why we can throw you in jail if you rape someone, for why I don't want to be your friend if it turns out that you have been backstabbing me. If it is true that influence is more than influence, that influence determines what you will do, then you you can't have expectations of people. You can't get upset when people disappoint you. You can't praise them when they do well. Everything we do in our relationships, socially and in law, suddenly becomes completely meaningless if genes do the kind of work that you suggest. Now, this gets us back to Christina. It's, there's a communication problem with how we describe genes, especially when we want the theory of evolution to be made um, as easily understandable as possible to an audience. And I'm going to introduce another big word here, because I do think that big words should not be shied away against. It's not the same thing as communicating. Communicating clearly doesn't mean some concepts um, should be shied away from. There's a concept in philosophy that we call anthropomorphizing. What it means is you give human characteristics to things that are not human, like a table. You know, like imagine a table just being beautiful or kind. Oh, you, you beat yourself. But it was, I don't know, it's a ridiculous example, but you might say, oh, this thing was kind to me, it could have been big. Obviously, this thing can't be kind, it's not a human being, right? It's a, it's a desk. So, if you give human traits to something that doesn't, ex doesn't really exist, then, then you're doing that. Now, when we describe genes, we sometimes do that. We sometimes actually get so ridiculous that we describe genes as if they are human beings that have this ability. So, you know, and, and that's kind of like where your misunderstanding comes in, because you imagine the gene almost like a person behind you as you are going towards KFC. The genes say, no, take it, take it. Yes, genes don't work like that. They're just things that are there. Right? So it's very important that when we talk about a predisposition or influence, we don't describe a gene almost like genes are persons that are just waiting around you to shove you to do certain things. No. There's a difference between influence or predisposition, whichever word you want to choose, and your behavior being determined. You will mischaracterize genes if you think of genes and if that is what genes actually do, to get to your question, the first thing to recognize is just in terms of what is at stake. We will be seriously in trouble if it turns out that genes don't just influence us but determine our behavior. Because everything that human interaction socially and legally is about assumes that the gene can't play that kind of role. That that difficult area that some people want to answer metaphysically and they're not the only ones. I mean, there's a massive history of, of philosophy that you're not doing justice to. But whatever your view is of that gap, whether it's mysticism, religion, whether it's just length of time before biology gets it, 
that work that's being done there by scientists and philosophers is very important to us. We need to bite our nails because the way in which that debate plays out in the history of science and philosophy of science, it's going to have a profound implication for whether it's fair to have expectations of each other, whether it's fair to throw Oscar Pistorius into jail for his behavior rather than he chose to do it. So the question of choosing versus determining versus influencing is hugely important. You can't be pissed off with Eusebius for being an arsehole if a gene has the power that you say that it has, right? So there's a lot at stake here. I don't know if there is the answer. Philosophers are not humble enough to recognize that there are probably scientific elements to this question, and I think psychologically as well, before we get to chemists and people who work lower down, uh, that we're not in a position to answer. We lower down in terms of cascading the levels at which you, 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 you are investigating people. The highest level may be sociology, then you come down to psychology, and so you go down to biology. That's, that's why I'm sure. <laughs> And the reality is that as philosophers, because we are, to your question, arrogant about our, our discipline, we just somewhat assume that we can sit in a seminar room and that feeling of freedom is justified. And the answer is that I can't answer that question. I'm going to have to get help from my friends in psychology and in, in other disciplines that look at us at, at an even more basic level than psychology. And then lastly to your question. Let me give an example from politics. That's actually what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, is mostly being a political analyst. There's one columnist who recently went through about 300, no, about a year ago, he went through about 300 blog posts of Professor Pierre de Foss. He doesn't like Pierre de Foss, and so he scrolled through it, and he did it notes in a word count of how many times um, colorful language comes up, you know, like crappy, awesome, whatever, just words that don't have exact logical um, status in debate. Cut a long story short, he used logical tools to say 675 times this word. They use this then and wrote a, basically a 2,000 word essay to try and reach a conclusion on the basis of formal logic with all this evidence and the search of different words that Pierre de Foss is actually a sloppy thinker. <coughs> He's a perfect example, and I don't want to mention his name because we're in the process of becoming friends. <laughs> it's a perfect example of what, of what Plato meant by the dangers of formal logic as a tool. And it's an example of what I couldn't quite get. I still have to learn how to communicate this point. It's, it's been burning to me for several years, so I haven't found the words yet, of why it is that you can indeed be, in one sense, logical, but intellectually irresponsible. There's nothing wrong with his logic, but clearly there's something odd going on here. We know, if you follow politics and constitutional law, Peter Force has got genuine insight. Peter Force really cares about social justice. This guy is really an expert in his field. He popularizes law. He communicates it well. He's an activist. He cares about people who are vulnerable. And he also intervenes in those debates as an expert. He's not just reporting on it. So we know that Peter Force is an intellectual giant. So how do we square that with the fact that this guy who's hating on him has come up with a perfect logical analysis of certain words? And the answer is very simple, that what that guy was doing in performing the logical analysis on Pierre's blog is a great example of when formal logical tools can be accurately exercised, but in the service of an intellectually irresponsible um, project. And that's why I'm not convinced that everything that has to be said about what it means to be intellectually responsible is just a matter of learning the methods of science. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Sebius. It was wonderful. And then for questions, uh, I'm sure we might be able to stay around a little bit for if people want to come and say hello to yes, you. Yes, just a couple of minutes and then I must run to KFC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And as a token of our appreciation, we have this small gift to you from Southwest Africa. Oh, thank you very much.